All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Allie Toomey. I am the Education Coordinator for Earth Echo International, and we have you all here today for a virtual field trip. Um, we are working with DC Water. Our virtual field trip is called Managing Stormwater with DC Water. So before we get started today, I, we already have some questions coming in and some great participation coming in from the audience. Um, but I just wanted to go over how all of our classrooms that are tuning in and watching are able to participate live. So if you're watching on G+, um, our Q&A app is enabled, so you can um, submit a question. We'll see it on the screen. If you see someone else that has the same question as you, you can give it a plus one, so we know that multiple people have that same question, um, and we'll get those answered. We'll probably be answering them more the end of the Hangout, um, so if you don't hear your question answered as soon as it comes in, that's okay. I promise we're getting to it. If you're watching on our website, um, under the viewing window, so under the video, there's a Google forum, um, and that form says have a question. All you have to do is fill out that form, hit submit, um, and we'll get that question here on our end. We already have some questions um, and some people tuning in from all around the country, from local um, in D.C. to Ohio, um, all over the place. So we're really, really excited, and thank you guys for joining us today. So without further ado, we're going to introduce our classrooms that we have with us today. First, from right here in Washington, D.C., we have Miss O's classroom, and they have a special guest with them. Let's go over there to Miss O's classroom. Hey. Hello. Who do you guys have with you today? We have a special visitor, Wendy the Water Drop from DC, from DC Water. Please say hello to Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. And we also have Mr. Trogdon's class joining us from Coventry, Ohio. So let's go over there. Hello, Mr. All right. We are so excited to have Mr. Trogdon's class with us. They just did some really interesting work um, around sustainable development. So we're going to hear from them a little bit later. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Next, we're going to go to James. We have James Wanberg. Uh, he's a resident engineer with the DC Clean Rivers Project. He's one of the engineers that's joining us today. Hello, James. Oh, he's muted. Just take a second. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. OK. I can't see myself yet. There we go. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'm uh, 140 feet underground right now. Um, we're uh, here with DC Water working on a gigantic tunnel system. Great. Uh, Allie, if you would, could you, show, could you show photo number one for everybody? Yeah, let's show them that. Give me just one second. Um, and we're going to, let me, photo number one. So this will give everyone a really good idea of where James is today. This is the site overview, correct? That's right. Awesome. Um, so we're actually going to head over to Bethany for a second and introduce her as well. Um, with us today, we also have Bethany Kovic. Of, she's the Green Infrastructure Manager for the DC Clean Rivers Project. And Bethany, where are you today? Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I am out at Fort Reno Reservoir, which is the highest point in D.C. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bethany. So I think we're actually going to go to you first. Um, we know that the first step for any engineer, no matter what type of problem you're working on, is to identify the problem and some of the constraints to creating a solution. So can you, Bethany, can you tell us a bit about the stormwater issue that occurs here in Washington, D.C. and many other cities across the world? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm so happy to be with all of you today to talk about stormwater because it's such an important issue. So let's talk stormwater. What exactly happens when it rains in a city? 
Well, water lands on roofs, roads, parking lots, and other impervious surfaces, and it creates runoff. And the runoff actually collects and runs directly into our sewer system. And Caitlin here, um, I have an assistant, and she's going to show you an example of exactly what happens. So you can see that water just runs off, and it basically ha actually carries along with it a lot of pollutants and contaminants, heavy metals, trash, debris, excess nutrients, um, et cetera, uh, when it actually runs off. And so that's why stormwater is a problem. The more impervious surfaces that we have, the more stormwater that we create. I'll just switch the camera here. Uh, and so that's why stormwater is really a problem. Uh, let's take a, a look at the difference between pervious or green space and impervious space. Allie, if you could put up that first image that actually showed the difference between impervious and pervious space. Allie, are you able to put up that image? Oh, perfect. There we yeah, go. There we okay. go. Everyone Excellent. should be able to see Thank it now. you. All right, great. So you can see in this image here the difference between the natural environment or natural ground cover and when you compare that to an urban environment which has impervious surface or non-natural ground cover. So impervious surfaces are basically um, different types of material that don't allow water to actually infiltrate into the ground. So that includes roads, sidewalks, rooftops, and other surfaces that don't allow water when it rains to actually go into the ground. So in a natural environment that does not have any impervious surface, what happens is it'll rain and a lot of that water actually goes into the ground as infiltration. You can see in the image that about 25% is shallow infiltration, about 25% is deep infiltration, and very little actually runs off. Some of it actually evaporates into the atmosphere as well. However, in an urban environment, you have the vast majority of that really is actually runoff. And that causes a lot of problems for our infrastructure and also our streams. So let's talk about exactly what happens in DC. Uh, Caitlin again is here and I'm gonna show an image of, of a map of DC and what it looks like here. Okay, so here's a map of DC. We did introductions at the beginning here and you can actually see where James is located. He's at the southern end of DC here at the Blue Plains Wastewater Treatment Plant. That's James. We've got myself up here at Fort Reno Reservoir. And then we've got the DC water mascot is at Langdon Education uh, Campus. And see, we find that location here. You see, what we have is we have two separate sewer systems. We have a combined sewer system, which is represented there in the blue. And that means that basically there is a single pipe that carries stormwater and also carries any water that comes from our toilets. That's called sanitary water. So basically there's one pipe that carries both. And the rest of the areas of DC that are not shaded in blue outside here and up here to the north, uh, we have separate sanitary system. And that actually has two separate pipes. One pipe carries stormwater and the separate pipe carries the sanitary flow. Allie, could you put up that second slide that shows the difference between the two different areas? Yep, just one second. We'll get that there. All right, it should be up for everyone. Okay, perfect. So everyone can see though that what the difference is between the combined system We lost Bethany for just a second, but I can go ahead and talk um, a little bit about the difference between the combined system and um, the separate system. So in the separate system, which is over here um, on the left-hand side, that is where the stormwater goes directly out into a river or a body of water, and all of that sanitary sewer water and um, wastewater is piped to a wastewater treatment facility such as the Blue Plains Wastewater Treatment Facility, which is the largest one in the D.C. area. In a combined sewer system, instead of having separate pipes, um, everything's in one pipe. 
And so normally, um, there's a block so that the combined sewer and stormwater can't go empty out directly into the river. It usually is all piped to Blue Plains to be treated before it goes out into the river. Um, but sometimes when we get a lot of rain at one time or we have um, huge rain events or hurricanes or something like that and there's too much water in the pipes, it trips um, a switch where that water is then just allowed to go directly out into the river, which is what you see here, without being treated. And so that's really the main problem that we were have that DC was having is that um, when we have large rain events, that sewer, um, our sewer system, our combined sewer system gets overwhelmed and it's piped directly out into the river. So we're actually going to go to James. Um, because DC is using a sort of two-pronged system to fight this problem. And so James is going to um, take us to where he is. And uh, I've been told we need to show that site overview again, James, because not everyone got to see that overhead picture. So I'm going to share that really quickly. And then you can tell us a little bit about where you are um, and how your help and how that's helping with combined sewer and stormwater issues. So if everyone can see that, that gives a really nice overview of the Blue Plains site um, where James is right now. So we'll go to James. Go ahead, James. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, hi, everybody. Good to be with you all. I'm uh, 140 feet below ground at uh, Blue Plains Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant. If you've all been to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge or uh, National Harbor, we're uh, just another mile north of there. We're basically at the bottom end of the district. This plant treats all of the... Uh, sewage and storm runoff from the uh, from the district area. So it's a, it's a very large plant. It's one of the world's largest advanced wastewater treatment plants. And um, we're here building a gigantic 13-mile tunnel system. We start digging from here, and we end up digging 13 miles north beneath the district. Um, and uh, the purpose of this tunnel system is to capture sewer overflows rather than dumping those sewer overflows in the river, which is what's happening now with the current combined system. Um, this tunnel system, if you can look behind me, you see that opening in the wall? I'm going to walk you all over there a little bit closer. Oop. There we go. You can see this, uh, this is quite a large hole in the ground. Um, we dig this thing with a tunnel boring machine. You can see the, uh, the photo on the screen right now. Uh, that photo was taken at the factory in Germany where the machine was manufactured. And um, basically, uh, this tunnel system is going to hold 157 million gallons of combined sewer overflows, uh, which is about the same as the size of one of the world's largest super tankers. Uh, so it's a very massive tunnel system. Um, the whole system drains by gravity to this point. One of the reasons why I'm so deep is that... Uh, this whole tunnel system has a constant slope downward to make sure that all those sewer overflows end up here at the treatment plant. Um, next, I'm going to walk you through this opening in the wall here. And there's two shafts next to each other, if you remember from that picture. It's set up like a figure eight complex. We're going to crawl through here real quick. And I'm entering this giant hole in the ground here. I'm going to look up. That's looking back up to the surface. You can see the cranes up in the air. That's how they support all the crews here. Um, these crews are actually working on pouring concrete right now uh, in this shaft. Um, this is one of the largest shafts uh, ever done for tunnel systems like this. There's been a few others of this size, but this is about as big as it gets uh, with the current technology. So um, how do we dig these giant holes in the earth? Well, we, uh, we start by sinking a five-foot thick slurry wall uh, through the soil. And then we dig out the middle with excavators. And the slurry walls hold the excavation open. Uh, then we pour a base slab of concrete. The base slab here, you can actually see if you look down, that's, that concrete floor there is actually a 25-foot thick base slab. All the way across this whole shaft is about a 132-foot diameter shaft. Um, so we pour the base slab. That kind of forms the plug in the bottom. And then we pour cast-in-place concrete liner walls, which is what they're working on now. 
You see these forms that go around the outside here? Those are like slip forms, kind of like how they, uh, they construct buildings. Uh, they pour these walls 15 feet at a time, and those forms get jumped up, and they pour another 15 feet and keep on going up until we're done. We'll head back towards the tunnel. And, uh, so that I showed you the shaft there. That's the vertical hole in the ground. <clears throat> now, how do we dig the horizontal tunnel? Well, uh, it's the tunnel boring machine. Um, and first, we have to assemble that machine. Uh, and then I've got a photo here, uh, photo number three, showing you this gigantic crane that we use to lower it down to the bottom uh, in the shaft. Can everybody see that all right? Yeah, photo number three should be the photo on the left. Yep, and then yep, perfect. The number four is the one of it in the shaft. Yep, so there you go. So that's me standing next to that crane. That's a 550-ton crawler crane. It's a gigantic piece of equipment. It uh, costs a whole lot of money to rent that thing. Uh, and then next to it, you see uh, Ladybird, the tunnel boring machine, sitting in the shaft bottom, getting ready to be launched. So you can look up, you see the top of the shaft, and you can uh, on the back side of that tunnel boring machine, you can see uh, those square pads. Those are actually the thrust rams, and that's how that machine gets propelled forward. So um, what we did next with that machine, we, we cut through the wall of this shaft to get started digging the tunnel. We actually took the cutter head and cut right through the concrete, and off we go. We pushed forward. Uh, we, we, we built this tunnel at six-foot increments. We dig six feet forward, and then we install a concrete ring six feet long. Can you all see those rings on the, on the concrete wall of the tunnel? See how there's bolted, bolted uh, connections between these pieces. So all these curved pieces of concrete we put together kind of like Legos, six feet at a time. Dig six feet forward, install a six-foot ring, and keep on going. We're about two miles. a lot of But basically, we're to for Oh, James, you might have to come out of the tunnel a little bit. We're losing... Um, we're losing you a little bit there. It doesn't seem like the cell reception is the greatest. 140 feet underground. So, sorry about that. How's this? That's fine. That's perfect. Much better. Okay. I was just telling everybody that our tunnel boring machine is about by Haynes Point right now. It's it's two and a half miles north of here. So, um, got one more photo to show you. Photo number five, and um, that's going to show you what it's like on the inside of that machine where we're actually at the front end digging. So you see all those, um, this is sort of a wide angle shot, it's actually a circle, but all of those uh, silver uh, stainless steel looking uh, propulsion cylinders, those are what we call thrust rams, and that's how the tunnel boring machine pushes forward six feet, uh, and it pushes off of the ring we just built. So you can see the concrete precast segments, and we push off of those with the thrust rams to advance the machine. The cutter head is still a bit in front of this area where you're looking now. The cutter head's another 20 feet ahead. Uh, so far, uh, with this two and a half miles of tunnel, we've used we've probably filled about 40,000 dump trucks full of muck. We move a whole lot of earth to dig this hole in the ground, uh, and all that muck could fill up the reflecting pool uh, probably about 16 times, uh, just for a sense of scale. So, um, with that, Allie, back to you. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, that is really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing all of that and giving us um, a tour of the tunnel underground. That's a place where nobody else from the public gets to go. So thank you so much for taking us there. And we're actually going to go to Mrs. O's class for a second because I think that they have a question for you about um, who was involved in this project. Mrs. O's class? What types of jobs are involved in digging this tunnel? Awesome. James, do you want to take that one? Love to. Yeah, great question. It might be easier for me to try to figure out which jobs aren't involved in this, but uh, let, me, let me give it a shot here. Um, so uh, to start off, we need to have a design, right? And uh, that requires all different types of engineers. For a project of this scale, basically every type of engineering discipline gets involved. We need civil engineers, environmental engineers structural engineers, 
electrical engineers, and mechanical engineers, and many others. Uh, then we need to go build, build the design, and that requires all of the construction trades. We're talking laborers, iron workers, carpenters, operators, mechanics, electricians, surveyors. We also need people that are interested in technology. We need guys that really know their systems, data management. Um, this uh, tunnel boring machine and all of our geotechnical instrumentation produces a tremendous amount of real-time data that we're always monitoring to make sure the work is going as planned. I can actually take a look at the TBM on my iPhone and see how it's running at any given time. It runs 24 hours a day. I usually flip on my phone before I go to bed at night and take a look at the real-time data. So we need tech guys to run that stuff. Um, there's a lot of project management staff. Uh, we have web-based document controls to make all this um, work together. Quality control, safety professionals. Uh, there's cost and scheduling for all of this work. We're talking about $2.5 billion of work here. Um, and we need people that know finance as well. DC Water just uh, executed a major deal with 100-year bonds. So that took an army of financial professionals. Uh, once this system is finished, uh, DC Water operations staff are actually going to run this pump station and the tunnel system. And the maintenance staff is also going to take care of all this, uh, these assets. Uh, so there's literally thousands and thousands of people that have been involved in this monumental effort to clean up our rivers. So this tunnel is only part of the solution. Um, can we get back with Bethany now to learn what else uh, DC Water is doing? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, James. So um, that tunnel where James is is a huge engineering feat, but where Bethany is as well is another really big engineering feat. And um, it's really cold in D.C. today, so her um, iPhone actually got a little cold earlier, which is why we lost her, but she's taken some time to warm up, um, and she's going to tell us about where she is. Yeah, I'm so happy to be back. Thanks, Allie. Uh, my phone warmed up. Oh, and again, here I'm here at Fort Reno Reservoir, so let me just change the, the uh, camera view here so that you can see exactly what I'm seeing. So Fort Reno is one of DC Water's sites that houses a drinking water reservoir. Drinking water is collected from the Potomac River, it's treated to make it safe for drinking, and then it's pumped to one of DC Water's reservoirs, just like here at Fort Reno. Fort Reno. And then it's stored basically until um, it's ready to be pumped to homes, businesses, and schools across the district. As I head up the stairs here, basically what you'll see is you'll see where the drinking water is actually stored. Uh, it's a it's a tank that's partially buried underneath the ground here. Um, and as I'm approaching here, you'll see it's about an acre in size underneath the ground. And there's actually storage volume for 5.8 million gallons of drinking water underneath this site right here. And we've actually built a green roof right on top of this, of this drinking water reservoir. Um, you know, 5.8 million gallons of water, that is a lot. What does that really equate to? That's about the equivalent of 165,000 bathtubs of water. So uh, quite large in size. Um, before we built the green roof here, basically there was just pervious surface here. And so basically um, runoff would actually land on this roof and would actually run off the surface. It would enter our storm sewer system. And we already talked a little bit about exactly why that's a problem. Um, and so green infrastructure um, is a way to actually allow that water to be um, infiltrated into the ground, stored for a little bit, cooled and cleaned and filtered um, before it actually enters its way back into the storm sewer system or into one of our um, bodies of water here in DC, which would be the Anacostia River, the Potomac River, or into Rock Creek. So I mentioned um, green roofs is one type of practice of green infrastructure uh, that we built here on this site. We've also built some pervious pavers here as well, which I'll show you in just a little bit um, where we put those. So what does green infrastructure actually do in terms of how much water does it actually filter or capture? Um, basically 90% of the storms here in DC are actually captured here on this green roof. That means nine out of every 10 storms, basically there's no runoff into our storm sewer system. So really green infrastructure does an amazing job of really capturing that storm water and mitigating for the problem of, of CSOs that we have. You know, there are also other types or other benefits to green infrastructure. 
It also provides habitat here in DC uh, for pollinators and birds and butterflies in DC. It mitigates for the urban heat island effect as well. So there are many other benefits beyond stormwater that really a green infrastructure can provide. Um, before uh, my phone froze there, I was going to talk about a few other types of green infrastructure. So not only are green roofs considered green infrastructure, but also bioretention is considered green infrastructure, cisterns or rain barrels, and then also pervious pavement. And Allie, if you might be able to put back up the slide that I was going to show earlier on uh, with the different types of green infrastructure practices, and then I'm going to head down to uh, show everyone our pervious pavement. Okay, the different types of green infrastructure should be up on everybody's screen now. Um, so if you just want to kind of go over really quickly, Bethany, what we're looking at. Perfect, right. So in the top left of your screen, you'll see bioretention is one of the examples of green infrastructure. And that basically allows the water to actually... Um, collecting those different practices, um, they're vegetated, they actually have native plants that are planted in them, and the water is cooled and filtered and it's stored for a certain period of time before then um, it actually goes back into the sewer system. Um, on the top right corner of your screen, you'll see different types of pervious pavement. Uh, so that could be either a pervious concrete or a porous asphalt. That could also be uh, pervious pavers, is what I'll show you here at Fort Reno Reservoir. There are lots of different types of practices that could be considered pervious pavement. And you'll also see an example of a cistern or a rain barrel. That might be something that you could actually install at your home, or you might see that installed at different businesses in DC or across the country. So this is just a few different types of green infrastructure practices. Um, and if we could just go back to uh, the screenshot Oh no, I think we've lost her again. Um, it's pretty cold out there in DC today, but she was going to show us some pervious pavers. And luckily, Mr. Trogdon's class um, in Coventry, Ohio, has their own example of pervious pavers. So we're going to go ahead and go to him really quickly. Um, Mr. Trogdon's class, do you want to show us what you've got over there? Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Covey. I'm an environmental educator at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. We actually have Coventry come into our facility and learn all about these green infrastructures, including pervious pavement, of which they just learned about. And Connor here is actually going to be showing a piece and talking a little bit about our pervious pavement. All right, so this is a pervious asphalt. Local community. Local community. What it does is it's going to show a demonstration. We're going to force some water instead of dirt. As you can see, uh, the video that we showed, that we all saw, when he dumped the water on the concrete, it made, it made a runoff. But with this appropriate asphalt, it will go through and hit the soil in two times. Great, that's right. So those pervious pavers are a really great option and part of green infrastructure because it allows that um, the water, instead of running off the land, to infiltrate into the ground, which is part of the natural water cycle. So that's awesome. Thank you guys for that great demonstration. And I think you guys also had a question for James about the engineering process. Is that right? Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Uh, I actually have a question for you. Great. Uh, what other major cities are following in these footsteps to improve their stormwater solution? Oh, was that clear? Can you repeat that for me? Uh, yes. Yeah. What other major cities are following in these footsteps to improve their stormwater system? Um, there's a, this, this problem is actually very common uh, across the U.S. and abroad, uh, worldwide. Um, CSO tunnel systems have been done uh, all around the country, including uh, cities like Chicago, uh, Seattle, um, San Francisco, up and down the East Coast, you know, New York. Um, I, I believe, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in Chicago, and I believe they have uh, something approaching 140 miles worth of tunnels in Chicago right now. Uh, so. Um, 
It's a um, they, they need a lot of storage because there's a lot of impervious area in these major cities. So. Great, thank, thank you, Gene. And then if you could also um, just talk, tell us a little bit about the engineering process, what other designs and solutions DC looked at, and if you guys developed any models while you were creating this um, two-pronged solution. Absolutely. Um, so just to kind of recap the problem, we sort of have a two-pronged problem. Uh, one is mostly a volume problem. It's basically that the sanitary combined with the storm uh, runoff, uh, those flows overwhelm the combined system that's uh, currently underneath DC. Uh, that system's been there for a long time, and it, all these, the volume of the flows overwhelm the system. The second problem is really a pollution problem, because when our systems get overwhelmed, we're dumping that in the river uh, to the tune of two to three billion gallons a year. Um, and so that, that's a pollution problem, because it affects the Anacostia River, Potomac River, Rock Creek, and all of those ultimately end up in the Chesapeake Bay, um, which is uh, really critical right now that we get that, that bay cleaned up as well. Um, so the objective for, all, for DC Water and all the engineers involved was basically to control these sewer overflows in order to meet water quality standards. That's, that was the goal. Uh, one other added goal that DC Water wanted to address was flooding in the Bloomingdale neighborhood. Um, so keeping those two things in mind, they went through a whole range of possible uh, solutions. They, they looked at a lot of alternatives and advanced the design of a lot of alternatives. They didn't just list them on paper. They actually tried to design each one to figure out if they're feasible. Um, they had to do extensive hydraulic modeling, uh, a lot of preliminary design and engineering. They actually did some um, environmental modeling for the water, water quality, a lot of analyses and studies. Um, the solution that we selected was what we were showing you earlier, which is the deep tunnel system and the green infrastructure. And they've also done some upgrades to other existing infrastructure like pumping stations and sewer controls and things like that. But there were dozens of other alternatives. Uh, some of them that they looked at were repurposing old abandoned sewers. Uh, they, needed, they needed the volume, right? So they might be able to renovate existing sewers that had been abandoned from long ago and use that as storage capacity. Um, uh, they also considered, um, you know, uh, satellite storage facilities, putting big underground tanks in other places, uh, or adding satellite treatment plants, and new treatment plants, not just the one I'm at here, but adding treatment plants elsewhere in the district to control the pollution. They also considered uh, pumping all of this uh, to the Blue Plains treatment plant through uh, new infrastructure other than a deep tunnel, maybe something at the surface. Uh, and one of the major items that, that, that was sort of a a big ticket alternative would have been a complete separation of the system. So the problem is the combined system where we have sanitary and storm together. You could separate those, but um, that, that was uh, all of these options were ultimately dismissed uh, because they were all very invasive uh, and highly disruptive to all the people that live and work and, and uh, commute through DC. Um, it was hard to find enough volume. And if they were going to do any of those other solutions, it would require some tremendous amount of open excavations in almost every block in every neighborhood. And it would have been cost prohibitive as well as very impactful to the community. Um, so our deep tunnel system here um, is uh, mostly out of sight, out of mind. Most of the DC residents don't know we're digging this tunnel. Uh, there are a few areas at the surface where we have giant holes in the ground. But generally speaking, our tunnel boring machine is doing all the hard work out of sight, out of mind for most of the residents. Um, the, uh, the second part of the solution was what uh, Bethany's been talking about, and that's the green infrastructure. Uh, and that allows them to manage the stormwater at the surface. And there's a lot of other benefits as well uh, throughout the district, like tree canopies and the habitat for birds, and it helps in the temperatures in the summertime. So that sort of wraps up our problem solving side of things. Great. And one of the questions actually that came in from um, iPrep Academy in Miami is they they wanted to know if a solution that was ever looked at was making bigger pipes or just enlarging some of the pipes and um, that already exist for that water to flow through instead of building this large storm water tunnel. Uh, well, that, that's uh, that was basically one of the considerations that uh, that I mentioned that. Um, they could be uh, redoing some of the surface infrastructure. Rather than a deep tunnel, they could work on the pipes that are already at the surface. Generally speaking, that would require new pipes. If you wanted to enlarge something or increase the capacity at the surface, that would basically require that you dig another trench and install something larger than what's buried there now. 
um, for the most part. And so that would that would affect almost every block in almost every neighborhood in D.C. You would have excavators and open holes in the ground, and there's a lot of impacts uh, that result from that. Great, perfect, thank you. I think we're going to go um, to Mrs. O's class if they're there. Mrs. O's class, do you guys have a question um, that you would like to share with us? We live in D.C. and know this city is growing. Will this plan still work as the city grows and more people move into more apartment buildings and office buildings? Great. Which one of you would like to handle that? What's going on as the city is growing? Sure, I can take that, Allie. Go ahead, Bethany. Yeah, so um, so back in a warm place, and my phone is working now quite well. So thanks for everyone's patience. Uh, basically, the system that we are designing right now for the green infrastructure as well as the gray infrastructure, the tunnels that um, James has been talking about, is sized to handle um, increased capacity due to population growth or increased capacity due to urbanization or more impervious surfaces uh, that we actually might build over time. Um, so that's a great question. We are planning for population growth and increase in impervious surface. Um, and actually what we've seen over the past several years is the rate of water usage is actually going down because people are conserving more water. They're installing low flow fixtures. They're watering their lawns less, which is, which is absolutely great. Great. Thanks, Bethany. And then I'm going to actually start sharing some of the questions that are coming in online. Um, we're getting a lot of really great questions, so go ahead and keep those coming if you're watching. But one from Mrs. Smith's class um, at Wright City West Elementary School. They want to know how much it rains in Washington, D.C. in a year. And I think that's an important question um, as we look at all of these solutions is to think about how much rain does D.C. really get? Yeah, that's a great question, Allie. I can answer that one. Um, D.C. receives around 40, 41, 42 inches on an annual basis. Um, so other cities may receive more or less, but D.C. is right around the 40 inch per year mark. So when I mentioned, um, hopefully I was still online when I was talking about green infrastructure capturing uh, a certain amount of stormwater. So the green roof that we installed here at Fort Reno is capturing nine out of every 10 storms of that 40 inches that we receive on an annual basis. Great, thanks. And another question that we got, and I don't know who would like to answer this, um, this is coming in from Ruth K. Broadway Harbor um, School, and they want to know something that we've heard a lot about in the news lately are, are sinkholes. And how does this system affect sinkholes? Is this a problem that we could have in, in the D.C. area or not? I could, uh, I could talk about that briefly. Um, sinkholes uh, could be caused uh, sometimes by aging infrastructure. Um, and uh, D.C. Water does a lot to uh, maintain and upgrade existing infrastructure. But if there's a leaking pipe, for example, you could, you could have a possible sinkhole for that because it could wash out the soil. Um, sinkholes can also be caused by construction, uh, and we take a lot of measures to make sure that our excavations uh, don't cause sinkholes. So um, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a few different factors, but um, yeah, anytime you're working in underground infrastructure, that is a risk. Thanks, James. Uh, another question that we got. Um, this one we got on G+. Uh, this one's for Bethany. They wanted to know how long it took to construct that reservoir at Fort Reno that you're at and um, how much water that holds again, if you could just go over that one more time. Sure. So, great question. The actual construction of the reservoir was... The reservoir was built in the early 1900s. I believe the construction date was 1927. So I wasn't around for when that was actually constructed, but it took, um, you know, I imagine at least a year to actually construct it and put it in place. And then again, the reservoir holds uh, 5.8 million gallons of drinking water before it's distributed to residents in DC. Um, and the equation that I used was basically that's the equivalent of about 165 thousand bathtubs of water. Great. Thanks, Bethany. And another question that we had um, come in from Miss Sendoya's class. Um, they're a fifth grade class. They want to know, if this is for James, so over at Blue Plains, how long does it take for the water um, to be cycled through and clean? How long does that process take? Uh, well, this, uh, 
this pumping station that we're going to build in the shaft I was showing you earlier uh, can pump 225 million gallons per day. So, uh, and that that's a that's a pump station that pumps directly to a treatment system here. Uh, if you remember, the tunnel system is 157 million gallons. Um, so we can we can treat more than one entire super tanker's worth of uh, CSO material in a single day. Um, the, the basic idea of this system, though, is that generally it's a storage tank, and once the rain event has passed, then we can really focus on treating and discharging the treated wastewater, just like we do with all the rest of our wastewater. So it's mostly a storage function, but it, it is also uh, able to treat quite a bit. Great, thanks. Um, what about either of our on-camera classrooms, Miss O's class or Mr. Trogdon's class? Do either of you have questions that you would like to share and ask? Yeah, we have another question, Allie. Go ahead, Mr. Trogdon's class. Did you hear that? Nope. Could you repeat it a little bit louder for the group? Our created wetlands and alternative methods to take the off the our created wetlands and alternate method that can be used to take some of the stress uh, off the current system? Great question. Bethany, do you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. That, that is a great question. So created wetlands are definitely a solution that we could employ. Uh, they function very similar to other green infrastructure practices that we could build. So basically, they're allowing um, the capture and collection of storm water before it would ever enter our storm sewer system. Uh, the challenge with constructing wetlands in D.C. or other major metropolitan areas is we simply usually don't have the physical space that's needed for constructed wetlands. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm also, we've gotten a couple questions again. I know. Jean I also have a question too. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Miss O's class. Good luck learning about STEM careers. James and Bethany, what is fun about doing your jobs? Great. What is fun about doing your jobs as STEM careers? That's a great question. Bethany, you go first. Sure. Okay, great. Um, you know, what I love about my job is I'm doing something different every day. I get the opportunity to do really fun things like these hangouts with students. Uh, we get to do really neat projects like construct green roofs over here at Fort Reno Reservoir. So I'm really doing something different and fun and unique every single day, and it is never boring doing my job. You took mine. <laughs> I, um, well, two things I really like about this job. Um, one is the people that we work with on these kind of mega projects. They're the best of the best, engineers and constructors. It's really great. Um, and it's a, it's a team team effort. Everybody works together uh, to solve all these problems for DC Water. Um, the other thing um, that I really like about being on a construction side of things is that there's never a dull moment. Every day uh, there's something new. Um, there's, a lot, there's always problems to solve. There's always big challenges. And uh, it's pretty exciting work digging giant holes. Uh, so it's uh, and and you can, it's very tangible results. You can see these giant holes in the earth that we dug. You can see the tunnel getting longer, um, and uh, you can see all the good things that it's going to do for our river when it's done. So uh, it's very satisfying. Great answers. Um, we're running a little close on time. I think we're going to go a little bit longer, but I know some classes may have to jump off. So before some classes have to start leaving us, I just wanted to ask a question that we've gotten is, what can students do themselves either every day or as a group to make an impact um, and reduce stormwater runoff in their area? So great question, Allie. I'll take that one. You know, one of the first things that you could do is, is simply installing practices on your homes or at the schools where we um, go to school or places where we, um, we have a great opportunity to either install a cistern on your property, actually con disconnecting a downspout that may be going directly into the sewer system and connecting a cistern or rain barrel, or you could install a practice such as a bioretention area in your front yard, or you could even convert your driveway to a pervious surface like we have here at Port Reno, either the, the concrete or the asphalt or the pavers that we have here. Great. Thanks, Bethany. Um, another question that we've gotten from actually more than one school is how much does this system cost? Um, 
we have schools from all areas of the country asking about the price of this um, giant tunnel that's being constructed. Sure. The, uh, the total cost for the Clean Rivers project is $2.5 billion. Um, it's very expensive to, to do this sort of work, but if you can believe it or not, some of those other alternatives that we discussed earlier would have been more costly. And um, so uh, this is about a uh, about 15 to 20 years worth of construction, and there was a whole lot of design before that. So those costs are, are borne by the ratepayers. Uh, the people that uh, pay their water and sewer bills are funding this cleanup effort. Um, and uh, that's that's part li partly why DC Water was uh, uh, innovative in securing these long-term bonds in order to spread out the uh, the cost burden of paying for these construction. Great, thanks, James. Um, one other question. Um, this is from a homeschool class. They actually want to know what you do with all of that dirt that you're removing from the tunnel. Where does that all go? It said you said there's enough to fill the reflecting pool 16 times. So where does that go? Great question. Uh, yeah, so we're not actually filling the reflecting pool. I'm sure you all figured that. Um, we, uh, we have a, a permit with the Corps of Engineers that requires all of our fill material to be uh, deposited in upland areas, meaning it, it cannot be deposited anywhere near a body of water. Um, so all of our permitted dump sites are generally in Maryland, within probably 30 miles from here. We have several, and a lot of them are old landfills um, or uh, quarries, for example, things that just need to be filled in. Um, so we, we don't get to do anything exciting with it, but uh, we're transporting it to uh, to you know safe locations, and we, we just fill in existing holes in the ground, basically. Great, thanks. And then another question that is actually coming from the Battle Creek Area Math and Science Center. They want to know what the ecological impact of constructing a large reservoir or these giant tunnels is. What kind of ecological impact that has. Yeah, the, um, one of the alternatives uh, that was uh, discussed uh, years ago was like uh, big basins. Um, that, that you could basically hold all of this rather than putting it underground. It'd be like an open open system, basically a big pond to capture all these. And um, and then they even did another scale test of uh, of um, containing all of this area within a part of the river that was cordoned off that wouldn't allow the CSO material to flow out into the rest of the waterway. Um, it was determined that the volume that they needed, it wasn't really feasible to do either of those things and there'd be a lot of other adverse impacts. If you can imagine, um, raw sewage is not really something that people want to see or smell or be anywhere near. And um, so uh, there, there'd be a lot of impacts to the community in doing that. And besides the fact that there's really not a lot of surface area available in the district for solutions like that. So uh, the best decision was by far to uh, stuff it underground in these giant tunnels that no one will ever see or have to be inside of. Great. And then, Bethany, um, I think this may be a question for you. We have a question coming in about plastics pollution in the rivers, and they want to know um, how plastic pollution is affecting, like, the collection and treatment of water. Is plastics pollution a really big problem in D.C.? So again, another great question. Um, plastics and debris that gets into our sewer system is always a problem. And so there's actually, uh, there are different treatment processes that are actually built into the wastewater treatment plant that actually filter out any type of trash or debris that includes plastic bags or other things that may make their way into the sewer system. It actually filters out those contaminants before the water is actually cleaned. And then once the water is cleaned, it's discharged back into the Potomac River. So we do have methods in place to actually filter out those contaminants. Great. Thanks, Bethany. Um, one more question that we had, and I think that this was a really interesting question. This was about STEM careers again, um, which Mrs. O's class talked a little bit about. But James, you mentioned people that are um, that were doing some coding work around the tunnel. And what do you know what type of coding that they're doing um, and what that entails? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Um, so in order to monitor how the tunnel boring machine is doing, this is just one example of many uh, different technologies that we need, but uh, in order to monitor the tunnel boring machine, there's a, a programmable logic controller, a PLC, that's on the tunnel boring machine itself, and it produces data every, every second and uh, some sensors every 10 seconds for thousands of different sensors, 
and they're all very important to see how this machine is running. And so uh, we needed a software solution that would allow us to look at that in real time. And um, me and my staff worked with a bunch of uh, software engineers um, to come up with a monitoring solution uh, for, for our project management team. Uh, the contractor also uses a similar uh, software uh, to actually run the machine um, with, the, with all the controls they need. Um, and so it's, it's, it's data management on a, on a pretty large scale. Um, and if you go to the, uh, we can maybe send a link around later, but uh, there's, a, there's a Ladybird Tunnel Boring Machine website. And um, if you go to that website, you can actually see where Ladybird is right now in real time. And there's a little animation that shows the machine. Um, and uh, and you'll, that machine, that, that graphic that you're looking at is actually linked to the PLC on the Tunnel Boring Machine itself. Um, so that's a, very, that's a very simple solution there, but that's just one of the many things that we do with the data management. Great. Thank you so much, James. Um, so then we just, I want to try and wrap it up here because we are getting close to 2 o'clock. Um, one question that we had from Mrs. Smith's class, fourth grade class, they wanted to know, does it get colder as you go down the tunnel? And I know Bethany has had a lot of problems with the cold today because she's up exposed on a hill. But James, it doesn't seem like you've had as much trouble with the cold today. Well, it's, uh, it's a nice crisp day down here at Blue Plains, but uh, no, actually, it wasn't too bad underground. When I started, I was uh, down in the shaft. You can all see now I'm back on the surface. I took the elevator back up. Um, and uh, it was still cold at shaft bottom. If I were to take you into the tunnel boring machine, I'd be taking off my jacket. Um, so it, it warms up. All the, uh, the drive motors and the hydraulics on that machine, they produce plenty of heat. Um, it's not hot, but it's, it's nice and comfortable. Uh, so uh, underground is, a, is not a bad place to be in the wintertime. So, and if you all want to, I can leave you with one view of uh, the shaft from the top now. You saw it from the bottom. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just show you a, a look over the edge here from the top. Let me turn my camera around. That would be great. Okay, so we're going to go up the stairs here to the, we call this the top lander's deck. Um, and this is where they control all of the overhead loads that are lowered with the crane. They sound the buzzer, which is kind of a horn, before the load goes down. Can everybody see okay? Yeah, great view. Thank you. Oh, okay. it's very deep. Yeah, it's a big hole in the ground. Um, so there's some cars over there for scale. You can see the cars in the parking lot. <laughs> and uh, then you look down, and you see some guys working on the form work. They're working on getting ready to pour concrete tomorrow. Uh, we're going to pour 1,000 yards of concrete on this liner wall tomorrow. So... Those people down there look like ants, but um, that's what we're working on. Great, and we're going to wrap up um, with just one more question from, again, iPrep Academy in Miami, and they want to know, is this is D.C. the only city constructing a tunnel system like this, or is this something that other cities are doing as well? Uh, there's many other cities doing this. Uh, D.C. is not the only one, um, and, uh, you know, they're doing the Thames Tideway in London right now. Um, there's uh, CSO programs on the West Coast, up and down. All of the major cities uh, have had this. Uh, like I mentioned, that Chicago's is, uh, is essentially complete, but like they've got over 100 miles of tunnel in Chicago, just like this. We know that there are a lot of other cities around the world that are working on the green infrastructure part that um, Bethany talked about. That's something that a lot of cities are employing now. So before we head out today, um, I do just want to share a few things. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to everyone who joined us today and all of the cl classrooms that asked questions. Um, we tried to share as m or get as many of your questions answered as possible. Um, right now, up on the screen, um, I have a link to uh, Earth Echoes um, Rain Check Action Guide. This is a great action guide that talks all about um, stormwater management, green infrastructure, and ways that you as students and classrooms can get involved and make a difference in your community. So this is a really, really great place to start. Um, and it's available on our website for free. In addition to that, uh, there are plenty of ways to stay connected with Earth Echo and with DC Water. As James mentioned, um, we are gonna we will share the the website for Ladybird TBM. Um, Ladybird also has a Twitter account, so you can. 
follow her live. She's quite the tweeter. Um, but you can also stay connected with Earth Echo. You can email me, education at earthecho.org, with any questions and follow along on our social media pages for updates and more upcoming virtual field trips. Our next virtual field trip is going to be December 18th, um, and we're going to be looking at farming across the country. So definitely something to stay tuned for. Thanks again for joining us, Mr. Trogdon's class. Thank you so much, James. And thank you very much, and everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.